Howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a distinguished engineer and the lead architect for Windows Server and the System Center products. And um, in case you're not up on current events, so one of my roles as a lead architect is to, I own all the technology planning for the server and the System Center products. And so every now and again we stop and we take a look at what's going on. And a few years ago I began to see some things that I found rather disturbing uh, in the area of security. And so I went and talked to our experts in this area and I basically came to a few conclusions. The first was that the bad guys were getting good. The bad guys were getting good very fast and potentially faster than we were getting better at defending. So as you know, trustworthy computing was something we started over a decade ago. <clears throat> you know, it, 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 we've paid a lot of attention, invested heavily in this, but it really just seemed like the, the bad guys were getting good very, very quickly. The second factor was that we became aware turns out they were always there, but we became aware of the role of nation state actors with unlimited budgets being used to go uh, at find vulnerabilities and attack our systems. Now at this point I discussed it with some people and, and a lot of people took the reaction and said, well look, if the NSA or the KGB are after you, there's really nothing we can do to protect you. And I thought about that, that didn't sound unreasonable, but then I realized that that was completely wrong. Just completely wrong thinking. Because the fact of the matter is that yes, okay, these guys have unlimited budgets, but the reality is that they're finding real exploits, real vulnerabilities in the system, and it's just a matter of timing before the really bad guys find the same exploits and use them. And then after that, it's a matter of time before the script kiddies are doing the same thing. So if you're not up on current events, there's a tsunami of bad stuff coming our way. Okay? And so this really led off uh, something we called the Assurance Initiative. Now the Assurance Initiative was a, basically think of it as a recommitment to the security and really sort of a massive reinvestment in the space. We need to up our game, the industry needs to up our game, and our customers need to up our game on security or bad things are, well actually they're happening already. You know, the, 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 the barbarians are at the gate. You, know, you can just ask the ex-CEO of Target as to whether he thinks this is actually a problem. I, I'd assert he'd say yes. So this is not, uh, there's no silver bullet thinking here. There's no, oh, if we just did X, all this problem would be gone. No, no, no. This really is, a, uh, you know, sort of a next wave of our trustworthy computing initiative, which is to say a massive long-term play to increase the level of security. I'd also say it's a much more a pr a mature approach. In the past, we took very much of a protect the platform approach to security. Uh, harden the platform. We are committed to that. We have some very exciting uh, investments we're making in that area. I uh, can't talk to you about them now, but early next year we'll roll some of that out. It's very, very exciting. Uh, but we're also adopting an assume breach approach. You know, assume that you've already been breached. What then? How do we detect the breach? How do we find the problems? How do we mitigate the errors, or the, the uh, problems, etc.? Now, GIA, this thing I'm going to talk to you about today, is just enough admin, and it's really just one small piece of this larger comprehensive program. Okay, so how many people know this guy? Michael Hayden. All right, so Michael Hayden is four star general. He was the director of the NSA. He was the director of the CIA, and he was the director of national intelligence. Now, when I originally gave this talk, I gave it to a group of Microsoft technical fellows and distinguished engineers. And at this point in the talk, I asked, now, how many people in this room are smarter than this guy? Turns out that was a wrong audience to ask. Everyone was convinced they were like way smarter than this guy. In fact, one guy stood up and he says, no, I know that guy. We're all way smarter than him. Anyway, that's not the point. That got us off on the wrong track. Here's the real point. How many people in the room have assets more important to protect than this guy? Well, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Very few people have assets more important to, to protect than this guy. This guy has a vested interest in, in making sure his assets are well protected. Now let's introduce the next character in our story. Edward Snowden, 30-year-old college dropout. 
Okay, so game on. Gentlemen, to your, to your corners. Let's see how this works out. Now, Michael Hayden went and made a decision that every one of us makes all the time. In fact, it, we make it so, so often and so frequently, literally we couldn't get our jobs done without making it. We make it so frequently that we don't even realize it's a, it's a decision, a risk that we're taking. That is, he turned to this Edward Snowden and he made an admin on his systems. And I can guarantee you that was the worst decision he ever made in his life. And why is that? And of course the answer is that admins are king, right? Admins can do anything, okay? Admins have the keys to the kingdom. Now, in a note of just pure irony, one of the documents Edward Snowden uh, released was literally called, I hunt and hack system admins. Literally, I'm not making this up. The NSA is hacking you, 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 why? They think you're an Al-Qaeda agent? No, they don't think you're an Al-Qaeda agent, but you have a set of credentials that give access to a set of machines that they want access to. So, who better to target than the person that already has the keys to the kingdom? So the bad guys are targeting the people. So that's really kind of the, the key observation here is that the, the, the admins are part of the attack surface, right? So often when we think about threat modeling, we think about, you know, physical security and we think about, you know, uh, uh, network, you know, firewalls, ports and parser attacks and all this good stuff. But the fact of the matter is that the, the admin themselves are one of the uh, uh, riskiest elements of your attack surface. In fact, one of the security researchers said, yeah, of course, you know, it, it's the, it's the kiddies that go after the machines, the pros go after the people. Okay, that's interesting. So GIA is really all about reducing the risk of, of admins. Now notice the words here. This is not eliminate. This is back to the sort of mature approach, right? There's no simplistic thinking here. Oh, we got the silver bullet. We're just going to make this problem go away. The problem's not going away. What we're going to do is try and help you manage the risk of admins. So what does that actually mean? Wouldn't it be great if people didn't have to have admin privileges to do their jobs. Yeah? Wouldn't it be great that if a machine got cracked, it wouldn't have high value, wouldn't leak high value credentials. By the way, this is incorrect. It's not if, it's when a machine gets cracked. Now, how many people are familiar with the pass the hash problem in security? Okay, so basically the model is this. On the network, on a, on a Windows machine, if an admin logs into a machine, his credentials get hashed and stored on that machine. Now, when a bad guy cracks that machine and gets local admin privileges, he's able to use tools like Nimicats to then harvest those credentials and then use them throughout the network. So they crack a machine, they harvest the credentials for anybody that's logged onto that machine. They then use those credentials to go get other machines and iterate and spider their way through the network. It's a truly horrifying uh, situation. So wouldn't it be great that when, if, when a machine got cracked, it didn't yield these high value credentials and enable the bad guys to spider their way through the network. Next, wouldn't it be great if people could only do the things that they needed to do, the only things that they needed to accomplish for their task, and wouldn't it be great if all admin actions were logged? Okay. And then lastly, wouldn't it be great if this actually got deployed and used, right? A lot of security things that we talk about are great, uh, but then they never get deployed. Or they get deployed and they get used and they get pulled out. And why is that? And the answer is they have to work, they have to be simple, they have to fit in with the operational life cycle. Okay? So indeed, this is about managing the risk associated with admins, not eliminating it. So literally, let's be clear about what that means. Uh, if you have people that have, say, you know, large corporation that has tens of thousands of people with admin privileges, we want to get that down to thousands. And once you get to thousands, we'd like to get that to hundreds, from hundreds to tens, tens to ones. Now you might think, oh, who in the world has 10,000 domain admins? That's just a ludicrous assertion. I'm not making this shit up. I'm telling you, it exists. Now you might say, well, how could that possibly be? And the answer is it goes something like this. You come to me and you say, oh, I need to do X. I say, okay, well, you need to be an, a domain admin to be X. But, you know, look, I don't know if you're going to be around, what happens when the next guy comes. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to put you in a group and then I'm going to give that group domain admin privileges. 
and everything's fine for about a week until you see, oh, look at this group. You know what? The other people that should be in this group are these guys. And you add a list, and in that list includes all the employees from this site and this and the, and the soccer team and all that. And literally, you know, just it just proliferates, and I'm not making this up. We've, we have a, a forensics team, a team that goes out and helps customers when they get in bad trouble, and it is not made up scenario that some of these guys have literally tens of thousands of people that have admin privileges on particular machines. Okay, so let's walk through our scenario. So we just hired this young admin, Eddie. I got my uh, server there with my treasure I want to protect. And uh, Edward tries to use PowerShell to remotely connect and manage this system. And it says, no, you can't do that. Talk to your, talk to your supervisor. So in comes our hero, and Eddie says, hey, Jeffrey, I need to be an admin on this box to, to restart SQL. And I say, no, Eddie, you don't need to be admin on that box. Just connect to the maintenance endpoint. He says, okay. So now he then creates enter PS session to that server, and he gives a maintenance endpoint configuration. He's able to connect to that. He's able to restart SQL server. Happy days. All is good. And then when he tries to steal secrets, you get this great error message. Error, you're not authorized to steal secrets. I, I just love that error message. But anyway, so he's allowed to do the things he needs to do the task and not other things. And of course, this is going to be audited and shortly we'll be taking Eddie out in an orange jumpsuit and, and uh, deal with that issue. So, so again, it's about incrementally reducing your admin exposure. Okay, So we want to reduce the number of people that have admin privileges. We want to reduce the number or the impact when someone has admin privileges. We want to reduce what they can do when they have those privileges. Uh, and we want to log everything. So this toolkit that we're talking about here is really based upon some technology that I developed with the Exchange team. So if you think about it, Exchange is entirely managed through PowerShell, uh, where a, an admin goes in and manages everything. So then they wanted to do Exchange Online, where literally they want to be able to provide mail access to everyone in the world. So now how is it that they're going to allow you the ability to add a mailbox, which requires admin privileges? Like, how's that going to work? I'm going to give it to you and you and you and you and to everyone. Right? So how's that going to work? And so what we did was we developed a set of security features for them. That's what they use today. They've taken that and they've gone even more sophisticated. But this, the techniques that we're talking about here are long-standing, uh, well-tested security techniques that we now take and we apply in a more general scenario, the GIA toolkit. So it has three simple concepts. The first concept is the notion of a toolkit. A toolkit is a collection of tools, collection of commands to support a particular activity. So in this regard, think, you know, you got a carpenter's toolkit, which is different than a plumber's toolkit, which is different than an electrician's toolkit, right? It's a container that contains the tools necessary to accomplish a particular task, right? So if you went into somebody's toolbox, you know, he's supposed to be a carpenter, and he's got a bunch of lock picking tools, you'd say, well, wait a second, what's going on there? So you want to have a set of tools that support a set of tasks. The next is we have this GIA endpoint. So a GIA endpoint is a management connection point where authorized users connect and get provisioned uh, GIA toolkits which run as this GIA endpoint account. And this GIA endpoint account is a local account with admin privileges. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to define a set of toolkits. When you connect in, you still have to be authorized. So there's an access control list that says, are you authorized in? But the key is that we're going to give that to users. We're not going to say, oh, you have to be an admin. No, 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 I'm taking your admin privileges away. You connect as a user. Then you say, oh, okay, that user's authorized. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to create a run as process. I log him in with a different set of credentials. Those credentials are, have local admin privileges. And we create an environment where they can only do a, spec a specific set of actions. It's that simple. And we log everything. Now, I mentioned to you that security features that aren't used aren't security. So one of the key things uh, originally, we're in fact, uh, I'm, I'm managing and deploying this on some 
production uh, Microsoft servers, the file system servers. And uh, when I originally came up with this idea, I talked to our security researchers and it was far more complicated than this. I had about eight different ideas, it was a wonderful system, and the security guys just said, oh, that's gorgeous, that's fantastic, that's exactly what we need. And then I went to the guys running the system and I explained it to them and they're like, yeah, no, that's not gonna work, <laughs> not at all. And so what we had to do is we had to simplify it, simplify it, simplify it, so they could get their head around it, be assured that they could be successful. The number one thing is that they can never put these guys in a position where they can't get their job done, all right? And so we'll talk about how I address that. But one of the key things was it had to be very simple to deploy. The way we deploy it is using PowerShell desired state configuration. So I'm giving a talk about that tomorrow. We'll go into the details, but essentially desired state configuration is a distributed, heterogeneous configuration management platform. Okay, so you declare the way you want the system to be, and then we make it so on both Unix and on Windows. Okay, so this is what that actually looks like. So here's an example of a of a desired state configuration document to manage file servers with a GIA endpoint. The key thing about PowerShell DSC is it is a mixture of imperative and declarative code. You know, the other configuration management guys in this space, they're purely declarative or they're purely imperative and then they quickly try and add some of the other. From the very beginning we are both, both imperative and declarative. So here, configuration is the same as a function definition. We're defining something that can be run. We're not running anything. So I declare something called file servers. Later you see down here is where I invoke it. That actually generates a document. So what I do is I do a for each dollar sign known in get file servers. Get file ser servers is a function you'd write. I wrote one. You would write it any way you want. You just need to return the names of the file servers. Mine's a simple cat of a text file that has the list of servers currently under management. I then declare that node. I declare a GIA toolkit. I say I'm going to have a GIA toolkit for storage tools. And here are the commands that I'm going to put in this toolkit. I'm going to give all the commands from the storage module and the SMB share, that's our file share system, all the commands in those I want to be part of this. I then define this endpoint storage admin whose toolkit is storage tools and here's the access control list. Now that is my definition. Here I run that and that generates my configuration file and then this start DSC configuration says grab that file and then send it to all those machines. Okay, so it's as simple as that. So now across tens, hundreds, thousands, as many as you want, I'm able to have a consistent set of configurations for security. It'll go create these endpoints, create the user accounts, set it all up, and then people that support that, that are past that ACL are given these commands. Now, okay, pretty simple, but it actually gets more sophisticated. So here I created one, SQL maintenance, a GIA toolkit, and now notice that this command specs is in fact a comma separated value list. Okay? So at this point what I'm saying is I'm going to specify in the SQL uh, module they can do all the get commands. So get dash star. So we support wildcarding. Here I say I'm going to allow get process. I'm going to allow get service. And here I'm going to do stop process. Now think about this. Imagine the case that says, okay, I'm going to allow you to stop process. But if I just allow you to stop process, you can stop any process. If you stop LSASS, you terminate the machine. You reboot the machine. So just because I want you to do SQL maintenance and I want you to, to be able to restart the SQL processes doesn't mean I want you to restart any of them. And this is one of the key contributions that GIA brings to the table. At some point somebody said, oh, isn't this just like sudo or RBAC or things like that? And the answer is yes, with two major contributions. One is the simplicity of definition, deployment, and maintenance. And two is this, the ability to have fine-grained control over the actions an admin can perform. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, yeah, you can stop processes, but you can only, the name parameter, you can only stop them by name, and I specify a validate set, and I say you can only provide these two names, calc or notepad. Now obviously those aren't the names for SQL, I don't know what the right names for SQL are, but there's a list of them out there. OK, 
okay? And so too here I say, well, you can restart services, but you can only restart them by name. And here I'm using a validate pattern. This is a regular expression. So I'm saying you can only restart services whose name start with SQL. So you can see that these toolkits can be very fine grain and very sophisticated. Now, if you want to, you can use Excel to uh, author these things. And again, because the imperative declarative uh, mixture within PowerShell, all you do is you say that command specs is you just cat the uh, CSV file uh, and it works just, just wonderfully. Okay, let's do a demo. Hoo-ha. Okay, now I can't actually see it here, so we're going to fly a little blind here. So here I've got demo three. Oh, let's go to demo one. Demo one. I've got a process toolkit. It has get process, get service, stop process, can only stop things whose name or not calc or notepad, and restart service can only stop things whose name begin with A. I then set up that demo endpoint one. I've already connected to that. This is NSN, that's new PowerShell session, uh, computer name, local, configuration name, demo one, and I enter into that session. So I'm, now I'm connected to that endpoint. And if I do a get command, you'll see quite a few commands, but the reality is that most of these are helper functions which I have deemed safe. So if I do that again and I say minus module process, you'll see it's just the, oh, you'll see it's just get process, get service, restart service, and stop process. Okay, so it's just those commands. And then if I want to stop, stop a process, stop process, God darn, process, minus ID zero. If I got this wrong, this will be a very short demonstration because my system will be tubed. And it didn't. It says, no, nope, you can't even do that. It's not even a security check. It just says, I don't even know what you're talking about. This command doesn't have an ID. And if I then say, well, I'd like to specify the name. And notice here we have IntelliSense. And it's showing me the only two values I can specify, calc or notepad. If I say, hey, I'm going to ignore that, do LSASS, again, I hope it works, because if it doesn't, I'm doomed. It says, nope, you can't specify that. The name can, does not belong to the set, calc, or notepad. So you're only able to do those things. Now, I'm pretty short on time, so I'm going to show you one other thing. Now, notice here, there's some things I haven't put as part of the toolkit, like PWD. No, nope, can't do that. CDC colon temp. Nope, can't do that. So I haven't even given access to the file system. So at this point I said, well, you know, that might be useful. I might want to do that. So here I've created a toolkit that has those, okay? Here are the, the commands to do that. And so I'm able to go in here and print working directory and cdc colon temp. And I'll do a dir and then say get process. Do I have get process? I don't. Uh, let's do, do dir and I'll redirect that to zzz.txt. Do, do, sorry. Oh, you know what? I don't have that one. So let's do this. Dir. I'll say copy, copy item up.txt to zzz.txt. So you see I'm able to do this good stuff, and I'll say delete, delete item up.txt. Now, well, let me ignore that one. Now let's do this, cat zzz.txt. And it says, no, you can't cat. Okay, so I was able to do all this file manipulation. I'm able to CD around, I'm able to copy files, I'm able to create files, I'm able to delete, delete files, ignore that error, uh, but I can't look at the contents because I didn't give you the ability to uh, look at the contents. I took that command out. And this is effectively the, the, the Snowden problem, right? Snowden was an admin. So he, knew, he was a SharePoint admin. So he could create SharePoint sites, he could back them up, all this, but he could also look at the contents of the file. He had no business looking at the contents of the file, and so that was the problem. With GIA, you can specify, you can do these things, but not those things. You can manage the, the files, 
but you can't look at their contents. Okay. Now, warning, at this stage, we're going to have a, a big switch. This has been a, a sort of a, a level 200 introduction concepts. Here we make a dramatic dive into the details. This is 400 level stuff. We're going to go into code. Uh, if you don't want that, that's fine. Uh, I will not be insulted if you leave, but it is going to be some code and some deep content. So it's pretty fun. Anyway, so first, why PowerShell? Well, PowerShell, G is all about controlling actions. And in Microsoft, PowerShell is the way we, we do that, right? So like uh, in G, so PowerShell is all about controlling actions. Now, like all the other shells, PowerShell can invoke executables, like anybody else, uh, and or commands. And we can control what gets invoked with mechanisms like path. But PowerShell adds this idea of command visibility. Okay, that's a key thing. Now, uh, unlike other shells, most other shells, uh, PowerShell owns the parser. That's why we have such consistent parsing, right? Is because unlike uh, in the Unix shells, you resolve a token to an executable, you give the command line to that executable, the executable does the parsing itself. That's not the way it works in our system. In PowerShell, the command gives PowerShell a data structure describing its data requirements. PowerShell then drives a common parser. So if you want to have a VMS DCL parser, perfectly fine. You can do that. Everything. Uh, anyway, so we own the parser. Now the whole point of this is that the parsing is driven off data structures. And those data structures are programmable. And one of the things you can program is you can manipulate the data structure and you can generate a proxy which is to say it is a function that has a, the data structure, that implements a data structure, that calls the underlying command. Okay? And this combination of command visibility and proxies is what makes this, avail, makes this work. Now at this point, that's going to be hard to get in focus. It will in a bit. It'll show you, show you the code. So first, let's talk about these constrained endpoints. So when you do PowerShell remoting, most often you're connecting to a default endpoint. It turns out there's many endpoints that you can have, and you can add as many as you like. Now these configuration endpoints have a name, they have an access control list, they've got a startup script, and they have a set of run as credentials, which is to say when somebody comes in, log them in as this and do all the activity as this guy. Okay? So how do you set things up? Here's how you'd set it up to get a, a credential, uh, register that, and specify a startup script, and then we showed you how you connect to those things. Okay, sorry. Now here's the key. The startup script, the startup script can do anything. Anything, anything, and that's the power. So step number one for security, you've got to eliminate the language mode. So PowerShell has a number of different language modes. Uh, no language basically says you can only run commands, you cannot define new executables, you cannot do uh, language expressions, things like that. So back to this example here, this is no language, this is full language mode. I can do things like 2 plus 2, and this is the no language mode, and if I try that, 2 plus 2, sorry, Do. Anyway, that would not work here. My mouse, I cannot find my mouse. My kingdom for a mouse. God damn it. Well, oh, it's over here. Two plus two does not work. More importantly, here I can say function, function foo, stop, process, minus name, lsass, which would be really bad, minus what if. I define something, and here I say foo, and I can run it. And if I try to do the same thing here, it's not going to work. And this is the key to security. See, you cannot create new, new executable code. Okay, so this is the key to security. Next, you can control what gets loaded and seen. So we have uh, execution context. You have session state. You can clear what scripts are available. By default, this is star, run everything. 
applications, native executables, you clear that. And then if you want, you can go add back the ones you want to whitelist in. Uh, and then all the commands you want to be hidden that people cannot invoke, you make their visibility private. And there's a few things you always need to hide. You want to set up logging. So you set up the logging through this. And PowerShell has very good logging. So imagine the case that you specified something like GPS, no, star, CA, star, pipe, to SPSS. Anybody know what the heck that is? Of course you don't. But remember, PowerShell owns the parser. We control, we do all the dispatch. So we've got infinite control over things. So in fact, down here in details, we tell you what that turned into. GPS turned into get process. The parameter was name, whose value was NO and CA. That then piped to stop process. So SPSS is stop process. And it bound an input object whose value was calc and notepad. Okay, so you got very detailed granular logging. Next, you create the proxy. Now here's where the magic comes in. I mentioned to you that we own the parser. So here's the parser. We say, I'm gonna get this uh, process, uh, get the, the metadata for stop process. Uh, sorry. What I do is I get command stop process. That gives me this. I then create a command metadata using that to get this. This is the programmable data structure. I now go in and I take the parameters and I remove the ID so I can no longer stop processes by ID. I go into the name, attribute, name parameter and I add an attribute. And this attribute says I have a validate set. These are the only two values that can be applied here. So I mentioned to you we own the parser. Part of the parser is for each data value, each parameter, what are allowable values? You do that declaratively. So we can change that, we can program that. And then lastly, I change the default metadata. And then we publish this proxy. So now we take stop process and we publish it as stop process. So now I've got two things called stop process. The user can invoke either one of them and both of them can be run, okay? The last step, is to take the original one and make it invisible, right? By changing its visibility to private. Now at this point, the original command can be run because the proxy doesn't do anything. The proxy just invokes the underlying command. So the underlying command has to be able to be run. But by changing its visibility, we make it so that the user can't invoke it. They can invoke the proxy. They can't invoke the underlying thing. And when you invoke the proxy, it needs to run the underlying thing, okay? So we have this proxy that only allows you to do these things, and it calls the general purpose function that can do anything, but it's the only one that can call it. And this is why it was so important to get rid of the language mode. If you give the user the ability to define new functions, they can just define a new function called screw you Jeffrey, and I'm gonna call stop process and give it anything I want, okay? So you can't let them do that. So that's the heart of it. Next, in the, in the startup script, you can do anything else you want. Just party on. In particular, so one of the key things that I, when I talked to the guys running the systems was there was great concern about being unable to accomplish something, you know, get their job done and then get in trouble because they were being secure. So if that was the deal, they were not in the, in the boat. So what we did was, and we haven't got this implemented yet, but we have a design for it, we're gonna be implementing what's called a break the glass endpoint. So what's a break the glass endpoint? Well, think about it. When there's an emergency, you break the glass, get the tool you need to address the emergency, but you've done so in a way that says, hey, what, what the heck, somebody broke the glass here. You know, let's go investigate. What happened there? Was that the right thing to do? So this break the glass endpoint will basically say, I'm gonna allow you to connect in and you can do anything. You can do anything you want absolutely anything. However, two things. One, I'm gonna record everything that you do and I know who you are. So I'm gonna send mail to your boss describing everything that you do. Now in a previous, in our configuration management uh, workshop this week, we talked about this problem of people going around the system. And I said, look, don't fight it. Don't fight it. What you do is you normalize it. You give people the ability to go around and break the rules to get something done, but you treat it like a service failure. You record it and then you do a post-mortem. Like, okay, why did this happen? 
you know, what was it about our system that made this the right thing to do? And let's go adjust that system. Or if there wasn't, then don't ever do that again. Okay? So you normalize it. So here's the way you do that. PS sender info, you get who the user was, who they connected in as, and then PowerShell has the ability to send mail. So you'll send mail. Uh, you can also then go grab the, the date of the time and say, hey, if it's the weekend, throw an exception. If you throw an exception in your startup script, that logs the user out. They can't go any further. Now, in fact, in the next version of Windows, we have a far more sophisticated mechanism called just-in-time admin. Just-in-time admin is the mechanism by which I give you a token for a very short period of time. Well, you decide how long, but I give you that token for a very short period of time. And it's very sophisticated, very easy to deploy and use, and worthy of an hour and a half long talk. I'm not going to go into it. So, and that here is with the GIA and our initiative that uh, the GIA portion of it is really the recognition that the admins are part of the attack surface. Uh, what we do with GIA is we incrementally reduce the exposure of admins, the risk of admins. We do that by reducing the number of people that have admin privileges. You know, there'll still be people that have admin privileges even when you have this system. Uh, we want to reduce the impact of those admin privileges. You get the admin privileges, there's only so much you can do. We want to reduce what can be done when you have those admin privileges and reduce everything. So again, we have those three simple concepts, toolkits, endpoints, uh, local accounts. So Michael Hayden, 2010, did a keynote at Black Hat. And this is when things were really getting bad. We really became aware of all these attacks on our systems. And somebody asked him, Mr. Hayden, Mr. Hayden, what do we do about all these attacks? And his answer was, man up and defend yourself. There's no backstop. Government's not going to protect you. There's no moats in the internet. You got to defend yourself. So GIA is a toolkit that helps our customers defend themselves um, by managing the risk associated with admins. And I think we got some time for questions or comments. Does this make sense? Hi, Jeffrey. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, so I guess my question is, what, what this looks like to me is you've basically made a, a firewall filter for commands. They yeah. don't get any options that you haven't explicitly, explicitly said they can get. Um, so like a firewall, have you done penetration testing? <laughs> Yeah, that was the point about uh, this is using the same mechanisms that Exchange has been using for years now. So yeah, it's all those same mechanisms. Now they host it with IIS and we host it with WinRM. So it's slightly different, but we've been doing penetration testing on WinRM from the very beginning. Okay. And I noticed um, in one of your examples, you, you said, you know, here's, here's my command, remove the following flags. What if someone, you know, Tomorrow, someone adds some new flags, um, and you didn't know, so you didn't know to remove them. Wouldn't it be better to only explicitly add flags that are permitted instead of saying remove these bad ones? Yeah, so here let me draw the distinction between the mechanisms and the authoring. So what I showed you was the mechanisms. Right. That's, I've got a startup script that's going to use those mechanisms. The authoring is a positive mask. So the positive mass says, here's the command, here are the parameters I want to give them. If they don't specify those parameters, they're removed. So it addresses that. Sorry, let me uh, say it a different way. Oh. The model, it is the model that you want. Okay. You specify the parameters you want to give someone access to. They're the only ones that they get access to. And then the code to implement that does so by removing the others. Oh, okay. So that because I saw it removing the dash ID command, you're, you're saying that's removing it from the list of approved things. Yes. Okay. And, but can't the approved list that the author of the command maintains, that, that could change out from under you. 
Um, so you're specifying it. You can specify wildcards, and so that if you specify, the risk would come if you specified parameters by wildcards, which is generally not a good idea. Um, but if you didn't do that, you're going to specify the names, and we're mm -hmm. going to generate the proxy, and then it's bound. It's not dynamic. Oh, okay. So those proxies are generated for you. So yes. Okay, I got you. Thanks. Hey, good talk. Um, so my question is, you have this tool, and I think it's like a really good new tool. This is a really neat idea. Um, I could see where you could transpose it into other OSs and stuff. Um, in your examples, you were using Snowden, um, and it's interesting to me. Have you evaluated policy against the implementation of this tool? So for instance, you always have to have somebody watching the watcher, or you have to have cross-authentication management, and so forth and so on. So what you're doing is basically abstracting another level to control this, have you have you done anything to evaluate policy and how this might be implemented such that you, you still wouldn't have a single person or a single group or a single realm that that can control everything? Great question. So let me be clear. That's what I mean by the word toolkit. So this is a, this is available now and it's experimental toolkit. You can download the code, download load the code, check out how we do it, test it yourself. And if you don't like it, you can change it to your own needs. But it's a toolkit at this point. We don't have a solution. A solution would be something that does the two things. One is puts a full comprehensive life cycle management around it that addresses the needs that just mentioned there. You're not, you, ultimately, you, it's a cardinality issue. You're just saying, oh, I'm going to change this, managing these things to managing a fewer things. But you still need to manage and secure those fewer things. We don't, you want to have a product that does that. And uh, the other thing you, that it'll do is, um, I forgot what the other thing I was going to do, but anyway, so yeah, you need to have a product for that. And currently, we do not have a product in focus for this. Any other questions? Okay, so come to my desired state configuration talk tomorrow. You're going to love it. It's very cool stuff.